Yes, I am fully charged. Are we on? We're on. Oh, praise God. <laughs> God is good. Oh, hey, yeah. only four minutes late. Hey, all right. Here we go. We're going So to... here's what happened, team, is that we're like, okay, 9 o'clock, let's go live like we do every night. And then it wouldn't go live. Nothing worked. We were we were crying out to Jesus. <laughs> we were like, so, help us, Jesus, help us go live. <gasps> Sorry, we're late because we couldn't get on. We couldn't get on tonight. Now I figured that would happen last night. I know. Yeah. Really, <laughs> I was braced for the apocalypse last night, but last night was fine. Tonight, and then tonight we can't get on. No, I think it'll be fine. We'll ask them if they can hear us because I just don't want to take any more time. We're just using the. Um, <laughs> thank you that you can laugh. <laughs> some are, are crying. Some are like, wow. Um, can you hear us okay? Because typically when I do my computer, we don't get as good of a visual. I know it's a little bit um, foggy and also the sound may not be as good. So if you can tell us, like, yes, we can hear you fine. Mm. Okay, getting a little bit of a thumbs up. That's, Hi, Zuka. Hi, David. That's Hi, great. All right. Okay, we're good then. All right. Please let us know if something deteriorates. We kind of expect it will happen, you know. You just never know. Uh, it could just be coincidental. Then again, unlikely. We're not sure. Anyway, right. I think we need to open an award of prayer now. Yeah. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Daddy. Huh? Wait. Daddy, come here. Would you open us up an award of prayer tonight? Oh. Daddy's come here. On Go pray for us. Here. This is Papa. This is Papa Dad. <laughs> hey, wonderful people. My husband, Lee. This is my dad, Dad. Oh, my goodness. I sit outside the bedroom door every night watching this on my, or listening to this on my rocking chair because I don't want to use up precious bandwidth watching it on Facebook. So, so sweet. Love y'all. So he glad you're doing this. This is us. so awesome. These are the yeah. world's best teachers. Hey, I'll make it quick because they, they got a phenomenal message for you tonight. Lord Jesus, bless um, your word as it goes out over the airways. Protect the bandwidth to make it possible. Um, take away all distractions from our homes and from our offices and wherever bedrooms, wherever we find ourselves right now. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your word would find its way into places in our hearts that we didn't know needed touched tonight. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your word through the power of technology tonight would find its way into hearts and homes and computers that never saw this moment coming. So I pray that your hand of blessing will be upon this time. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Amen. invite someone else to it. Evidently, there's something powerful about to happen. When something's highly opposed, I get really excited. Something yeah. good's about to happen. God bless you. I just Rock realized Papa, if my fan goes on, that's going to pick it up. because. So I think I do need to use Where's an the external mic. mic. So let me get that. Okay. okay. Go ahead, guys. While she's doing that, I'm going to get us started. Thanks, Daddy. Yep. Thanks, Mom. Ex explain to them what's going on if they just logged in. If you just logged on, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty. You know, Satan likes to work through technology. He has demons assigned specifically to our live stream, apparently. <laughs> and we're just having a little technical, little technical trouble today. But everything's going to be fine, and we get to start... Fresh tonight, we're in Luke chapter 4 today, and yesterday we went through Luke chapter 4 verses 31 through 37, and it was fantastic, and if you missed that, I encourage you to go back, whether you're on the Facebook page or on YouTube, watch that, it will really inform um, some of the stuff that's going on here. Um, but I want to just take us through um, very quickly, let's start again in uh, verse 36, which is sort of where we left off last night. And this is Luke chapter 4. It says, all the people were amazed. They were amazed because Jesus just cast out a demon. It was like not a small deal. It says, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So now I have to hook it up to the external mic. This is Meditate so awful. I know that they might count off. Oh, Noelle, how do I do that now that we're already live? I have no idea. Edit post. Maybe edit. Probably. Mm -hmm. You can unplug it and just go back to whatever. Hi, team. We do apologize. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. You got it. All right. So now what we need from you, team, comment again. Can you hear us? I'm sorry. Worst start ever. We'd love to start over. Oh, look, and I, now I have a halo over my head. You look beautiful. 
painful. It's the Lord. Don't worry. It's okay. It's Jesus over your head. All right. Everybody can hear us? Rhiannon says we can hear still. Rhiannon's across the street, so she probably just has her windows open. <laughs> she can probably just hear us. <laughs> thanks, Rhiannon, for watching. All right. Okay. Okay. So sorry. Ah. All right. Hey, thanks for trying to stop us today. We're not going to stop it. He's probably not even involved. Probably a demon. Who knows? That's what we talked about last night. You're like, yeah. really? You think Satan it might just being be a finite being person who has... Too. It's right. probably just Apple. Okay, so I just heard what Noah was reading here. Um, okay, so so when it says in verse 36, we're in Luke 4, 36 at the moment, that the people were amazed. If you if you kind of get into the like the original language of it, it's like jaw like on speechless the ground. Dumbstruck. Am amazed just kind of doesn't really cut it. They could not believe it. What is this teaching? And the authority, and, and he gives orders over evil spirits, and they come out. So I did a little research today on what the typical exorcism would have looked like. I thought like. this was so interesting. I thought it was interesting, too, of this time. Because clearly what Jesus did by just saying, shut up and get out to the yeah. demon, and he does it immediately. Not normal. That is not at all normal. So what we found is that back in this time, in this Jewish region, what the Jews would do is exorcisms would be a public sort of forum. They would have to have at least 10 men, which is what you had to have to have a synagogue anyhow. Mm -hmm. They would get the demon-possessed person, and then they would try to make sure that they really were demon-possessed. So they would right. look for things like swelling. Like um, totally arbitrary things. Like the Bible does not give us prescription of like, these are the things that you'll see. They're just yeah, like no. coming up with stuff. Markings, paralysis, things like that could have very easily just been due to like a stroke. But, you know, they were looking for this. Then, and I think this is really interesting, they would interview the demon. So they would try to, the opposite of what we said last night, like don't talk to the demon. If you missed it, like Noel said, go back and listen to that because it's really informative. Uh, so they would talk to the demon, they would interview the demon, and they would try to get the demon to tell them its name. Then they would take that name and they would try to rebuke the demon with the name and they would, they would dogpile the name of the demon and then they sometimes would fumigate. They would actually try to smoke them out or sulfur gas or something. Like, can you imagine if you were the person? Like, that could kill you. Yeah, and assuming you just had, like, a stroke or something or maybe, like, Oh, something. it would be terrible. Oh. Yeah, they'd want to beat the demon out. So they'd get rods and just beat up on the person. It's trying horrible. To beat the demon out. And, so, uh, and here's the thing that I think is interesting. Not successful. This doesn't go well. No, usually not at all. As you can imagine. Yeah. That, and so when Jesus... With zero fanfare, yeah. without asking it any questions, without interviewing it, he goes, be quiet, get out, and the demon does it. They're like, Ooh, oh, so this guy has authority? Yeah, you can see why they were so dumbfounded. They had never seen anything like this before. This was, this was new. Yeah. This was new. All right. Here's something else interesting. And, and the Bible doesn't really say too much about this. In fact, I totally missed it last night, but mm -hmm. Noel had caught it. If you, if you go back up to verse 31, that all of this happened in verse 31 on the Sabbath. They had a lot of rules and regulations on the Sabbath. And um, all that God ever said was just rest, don't work, take the day off, basically. That was it. it within those parameters, everyone was free to follow that. Um, but then... They got to the point where the leaders were not happy with how that was going, and so the religious leaders started to impose more rules, and, New more rules. rules and more rules until it got utterly ridiculous. I mean, yeah. ridiculous. Like, if you ever are bored and you might be in, during those days, <laughs> just look up like um, biblical time Sabbath rules, Google it, and just read like how much yeah. water you were allowed to carry, like a thimbleful, but not more than that at a time. How are you supposed <laughs> to do anything? In many ways, it actually created. So much more work so for them. Much more There's work. all this stress around the Sabbath. I mean, yeah. I have friends today. They're Sephardic Jews. They live in New York. They hold the Sabbath to yes. this day. Yeah. And many, many Jewish people will. The, the work they have to do to prepare for the Sabbath because yeah. they can't make a meal for themselves. They can't turn on a light switch for themselves. Yeah, they right, can't and, take and public it, transportation. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, it was just supposed to be God wanted it to It be. was supposed to be a day of rest. It was it supposed be, to be something new around your Yeah. Night. So anyway, all that to say that Jesus uh, cast out that demon on the Sabbath, and I have a feeling that was part of the. Oh boy! Whoa! He did 
what? He did that on the Sabbath. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so we can continue into verse 38 now. Yes. You want me to read that? I do. It says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. Now, I think this is important, because you, you went back, we, she, she made the comment earlier, she said, you know, it's interesting they say, you know, help her. They didn't ask him to heal her. Right. Yeah. And so, did a little research on what those original words in the translation said, and I thought you came to a really interesting conclusion. Yeah, when I looked it up, because I wanted to know, did they ask him to help her? Or did they ask him to heal her? Like, what well, was that difference. word? So I, I looked it up. If, by the way, we're never trying to hoard resources. If you ever want to see what the exact word was, yeah. just Google interlinear Bible. Interlinear Bible. And it will, tell you everything. it will bring up the English with the Greek under it. And if you click on the English word, it will take you to another page. And it will give you the exact meaning of the Greek word. And sometimes there's a couple meanings. Like in English, you might see in a dictionary, you know, the first meaning is the most popular, and then maybe there's a second meaning that's similar, but not as popular. And it will do that for you. So, yeah. I, so I did. I looked it up. I thought, I want to know what it says. And the really interesting thing is, it's not even there. Like the word help or heal, not there. Not there. All it says is that they asked Jesus. They just that's asked it. Jesus. And so I guess, I think what's really interesting is, here it is the Sabbath. Um, we, we believe that Peter's house was extremely close to the synagogue, like literally next door. I've actually been to the ruins of, so what they, cool. <laughs> yeah, of what they believe is the synagogue and Peter's house, and I couldn't believe how close they were. Now, I don't yeah. know if that's true or not, but it's what they purport. But anyway, so it was the Sabbath, and I can imagine Jesus walking over there, which would have been a short enough distance, if this is true, that he would have been okay to within their realms. He didn't care what their rules were. Right. They wouldn't have freaked out. And, and they... They have Peter's mother-in-law. He was married, by the way. You don't have a mother-in-law if you're not married, so he's married. And she's really sick. She's really, really high fever. High fever. People she's got die an from infection. That. There's no Advil. There's no Tylenol. And the rules of the Sabbath at this time were that you cannot help a sick person on the Sabbath unless you are positive that they will die if you don't do something. So if they are on the brink of death, you can help them, but only to the point that you prevent them from dying, not to the point that you actually, like, really help them get better. So Jesus comes in. It's the still the Sabbath, and there's the mother-in-law. She's very ill, high fever, raging infection somewhere, and it just says they just look at Jesus and they just God. And I sort of imagine this as being, you know, they know what the rules are. They're Jewish. Yeah. They know that he's not allowed to heal, but they just saw him cast out a demon. Like, I mean, if anybody could, it's this guy, and we don't yeah. know what she's going to be tomorrow. And I imagine them just kind of like bringing him in, being like, she has a really high fever. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to, do you want to, do you want to say hi? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, that's sort of how I imagine it, almost, almost sheepish. They just, they just ask him. Yeah, exactly. And it says that um, he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And then I think what happens next is so interesting. Mm -hmm. She gets up and she starts serving them. Have you ever had a fever break, a really high fever, and it breaks? What is the last thing you want to do at that moment? Basically, get up. Right. Go wait on your son-in-law and his friends. You are. I'm going to mute this because I heard that thing go off. There we are. You are wiped out. Yeah. And all you can think of is, I hope that thing doesn't come back. And if I don't move, maybe it won't. Yeah. When Jesus heals, it is complete. It is thorough. It is instantaneous. It doesn't require, by the way, I don't see anything in here about him saying to her, do you have enough faith? Do you mm. have faith? Because if you have faith, I can heal. And, and all of the rest of you guys, do you have enough faith? Because if not, my hands are tied. Can't heal you. This is what you hear on television so often. Yeah. That God wants to heal you. And if you don't get your healing, guess what? Well, that would be on you, wouldn't it? I've actually heard preachers say, it's not God's fault if you don't get healed. So whose fault is it? It would be your fault. And yeah. that's what they teach. Okay. Heresy. Absolute heresy. Does God want us to have faith? 100% yes. 
Is he pleased with our faith? Yes, we need to have the faith. But here's an instance where there is nothing recorded about her asking him about it. There's nothing recorded about her believing that he can do it. We don't right. even know if she was conscious. She may have been asleep or something because the fever was so yeah. high it knocked her out. So I bring that point up because I want you to know, especially with everything going on right now with this COVID-19 thing and people sick and some of them unfortunately gravely sick or dying. This is not an, a situation of, well, if these people just had more faith, they right. wouldn't have it. They could get over it. That is not that is not true. Some of them have tremendous faith, and God has chosen to let this happen anyway. All right. The mm -hmm. mic's really picking up the fan, apparently. Oh, thank you. All right. We're just going to, yeah. If you're, if you're joining us, we had a terrible time just going online tonight. Like, just, <laughs> we couldn't, we couldn't get online. And so we are now completely jerry-rigged. <laughs> I think it's working. We just moved the computer away from the external mic. Uh, Hopefully that my helps. My friend Desiree says, I can hear you both. Yes, I can hear. Oh, that, yeah, that might be That was earlier. earlier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody says that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and we also have to remember that, so in this time, and, and we'll, we'll even see this a little more, there was not a lot of empathy towards you. Good point. If you were sick, and why if there was something that? wrong, no, wow. because they believed that if you were sick, if there was something wrong with you, if you were diseased, that was God's judgment on you for something you did. Very much a karma kind of mindset. Well, you know, if something bad is happening, you must have done something bad. That's right. God's punishing you. And it's just tit for tat, you know. Yeah. And and so they didn't have. Um, they didn't have a lot of empathy whatsoever towards people who were sick, who were hurting. They said, well, clearly you deserve it because God wouldn't let something happen to you if you didn't deserve it. That's right. Right? Why don't we believe that to be true? Well, we know from Scripture that there are times when bad things just simply happen. Uh, I know that there are people right now going, oh, God is judging the world and he's angry with us and that's why this is happening. Yeah. Guys, we just don't know. No. We don't know. Sometimes a germ escapes because we have germs and they're it's part of it's part of it's it's part of I'm again just Jerry rigging give me a second it's part of sin though right this is what you get when there's sin in the world it's yeah. it's a bummer and sometimes it's not your fault you know what and if you are really struggling right now and I, listen I know some of you are I know some of you've lost your job some of you yeah. own small businesses and you are you are having the terrible um, job right now of letting employees go That's or laying hard. them off and you feel personally responsible and and you're looking at your bills and you're going I don't know how we're gonna pay these I don't have any money coming in right now yeah. and maybe you're thinking to yourself what did I do what yeah. is this God punishing me am I being punished for something do I not have enough faith if I could just muster up some more faith that's not it we live in a fallen world and bad things just happen but here's the thing and we want you to see this tonight is that Jesus walks through them with you. Always. And he may not fix it the way you want him to fix it, and that's okay, because he might have a different plan, but he does not leave you. He does not leave you. Yeah. I'm Absolutely. hating this thing over my head. Okay. <laughs> I we have to make a decision. I can't take it anymore. No, we have to make a decision. Now I have bunny ears. <sighs> you look adorable. No. I hate Stop. It. Stop it. Stop it. We need to we need to keep teaching right now. Okay. People need to hear about Jesus, Mama. Yeah. <laughs> um, roll reversal. She's like, sit down, sit down, sit All still. Right. Let's pick it up in um, in verse forty. I think that's fantastic. It says, when the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, "You are the Son of God!" But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Okay, can we stop there? There's so much there. Yeah, where right. do you want to start? Well, <laughs> I think the part that really just hit me is how the demons know who he is, and they they come out shouting, and we saw this last night yeah. when the demon possessed man, right? That you are the son of God, we know who you are, you're Jesus yeah. of Nazareth, and Jesus says, don't talk, he shuts them up. Why does he not want them we want to hear from you. Why does he not want them talking? Yeah, we see this every time with the demon. Every time they say, you are the son of God, you yeah. are Jesus of Nazareth, you're right. Messiah. Correct? I mean, they're, they're telling the truth. They got it right. Like, for people who can't figure out if Jesus is God or not, honestly, um, the demons have no problem with this. They believe in his deity. They know yeah. exactly. And they're, as we said last night, 
freaked out and terrorized by it. Why won't so, Jesus let them say it? Why does he always tell them to stop talking? Yeah, since they're actually correct. Why does he not let them? The one time they're telling the truth. Yeah, we're excited to hear what you guys have to say on that. If you're just joining us, we're in Luke chapter 4. There is a bit of a delay. We've had all kinds of technical problems. I still have a halo. Don't worry about it. No, I have Stop about it. Can't help it. No, you can. (laughs) (laughs) So we're waiting to hear from you because there's a little delay here as to what you think about Jesus telling those guys to uh, the demons. Telling the demons, don't to talk. stop talking. Don't don't say it. Don't say who I am. Yeah. I, I also just think it's really interesting that every time, I mean, this is true of every demon encounter, they always call out every single time who he is. Yeah. Which is so interesting. Um, Lisa says to show his authority, and Bob says it's because it wasn't Jesus' time. Okay. Cindy says it's to show they have no power. Cindy, that's a very interesting point that I think maybe we should get to. Mm-hmm. Um, Billy says, I have no clue. <laughs> it's awesome, Billy. Yeah. Appreciate you. Um, Holly says, he knew he had to go to the cross, not become king. And Aubrey says, maybe because he doesn't want people to trust the authority of the demons. Okay. God will reveal things on his own timeline. That was not the time. <laughs> Kathy says, when are demons telling the truth? I think you sort of just got to the face of it. It wasn't time for his identity as the son of God to be revealed. Just Baron Worthy to say his name. Lauren yeah. Says. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all. The a little somebody said. Okay. Are we good then? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Those I are. Staff. I need... oh, thank you so much. Why did I not think of that? <laughs> These are all great replies. Okay, so I think there are there are a couple things we want to get to. Okay. And I love the answers was to say to show they have no power. Mm-hmm. And we're, we were planning to talk about this a little bit later on, but I think we'll touch on it just a little bit. And this is a cultural thing that we know, and it's why we went through what everybody's names meant at the beginning of this study. You know, what does the name Jesus mean? What does the name John mean? Their names had incredible meaning. Their names said a lot about who they were as a person, mm-hmm. right? Their identity, their character. And so in that culture, when you knew somebody's name, you knew a lot about them, right? You had a lot you had a lot of insight into them. And so generally, unless you were very, very tight with somebody, you wouldn't, you wouldn't call them by their name. That's why when we see people referring to Jesus, they'll call him rabbi or teacher, right? Um, and so when the, demons are, when the demons are talking, they always call him by name. By, they say Jesus. And, and that would have been like, whoa, you guys know who this, like the people watching would have been like, that's, whoo. Okay, that's crazy, and Jesus shuts it down. Like, no, you, you're not going to share who I am. But I think somebody else made a great point, and yeah. that was, mm-hmm. when do demons ever tell the truth? Well, it would be like so this. good. It, pretend like you're, you're in a courtroom in front of a jury, and, you, and you're innocent, and you need a witness to prove you're innocent. Yeah. And your lawyer says, oh, we've got a witness, we've got a witness. He's a serial killer. <laughs> You'd be like, Ugh. Not no, that guy. Not him. Because nobody's going to believe that guy. In fact, that's going to incriminate me. That's going to exonerate yeah. me. Now, now I'm associated with him? Wrong witness. Okay? So when the demons are going, we know who you are. We know who you are. You're the son of God. You're the son of God. Jesus is like, shut up. Because not no, no. nobody is going, it, it does the opposite. Right? right? And I really honestly think that they know that. Yeah. And they're just trying to tank him on their way down. I mean, they are, as we said last night, pure, unadulterated, evil, to the core, on every possible level, like beyond our comprehension. Right. There is not a shred of good in them. So they cannot do good. So they're not saying it because they're trying to help. <laughs> they're only trying to destroy. Yeah. And, um, and they know they're going down, so they figure they'll go down in a big kaboom, I guess. I yeah, know. Absolutely. I also just want to talk about this. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Um, So this is interesting. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Sabbath is sundown to sundown, right? Right? So sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And so even as the sun, the sun hasn't gone down yet, as the sun is setting, Jesus is healing people and he's casting out demons. So he's doing all of this on the Sabbath. That wasn't, I mean, not that anybody had come and been like, I'm going to heal a couple hundred of you today. And the Well, rep. they couldn't get to him. They couldn't go that far. They right. had to wait until the Sabbath was over. And then they could bring their sick and demons yeah. and rest Isn't him. that just awful? Isn't that something? 
That's how that's how under the authority of the rulers yeah. they were and how silly that was. Yeah. Um, should we go on? Yeah. At daybreak, we're in verse 42 now. Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. You know, I think what's interesting here is he didn't say, I have to go because other people need healing. Yeah. I have to go because there's other people who are demon-possessed, and I have to help them. What did he say? I've got to go because I've got to preach. I've got to teach. I've got to tell people the yeah. good news of the gospel that it is through me that they will be saved from their sin. Yeah. That's what he came to do. He did not come to be a good teacher. He did not come to be a prophet. He did not come to help people be more moral or to make their lives 20% better. He yeah. came to save sinners from their sin. That's why he came, and that's what he was about. He was always preaching and teaching. The miracles he performed were to validate his claims. He's not the only person who's ever claimed to be the Messiah. We've got some right now who yes, claim to be the Messiah. Yes, we do. There's always people out there who say, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they were before him, and they've come after him. But the difference between him and the others is that he can exercise power over the demonic world, just like that. He has power over sickness and disease. We don't even have that with yes. modern medicine. Yeah. Here we all sit in quarantine right now. If, if you're watching later, this is being recorded live um, during the quarantine of COVID-19. I haven't left the house in eight days. No, I haven't either. It's been a great eight days, honestly. Yeah. But, but it, it can get different. long, and some of you are watching tonight, and I've been messaging with you, and you've said, I'm, I'm starting to feel like, wow, I'm, I don't have anything. Like, mm. The days are long. And, I, and I'm so glad that you join us in this. Honestly, that's part of why we do this yeah. every single night at nine, because we know these days are getting long. And especially if you're not working from home, if your job has been cut or you've been laid off, um, it can start to feel a little desperate after a while. Yeah. So we're really glad you're here. And we hope that this is encouraging to you. This is a special time. Yeah, so he keeps on going and preaching across Judea. And so now we're going to go into Luke chapter 5. Right. We've made it. And by the way, some of this is thematic. Um, mm -hmm. Judea is in the southern part. We start back up in Galilee, which is in the northern part. So that it's not sequential always. It's just saying he went to Judea to preach. Now Luke is going back to Galilee in the northern part, and we're going to read about the calling of Peter. This is a great story. Yeah, we're going to love this. It says, one day... As Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. I think this is a great place to stop. I do too. Let's, let's pause here for a moment. Let's talk about this. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So we have to kind of get back into this time period again so we can really picture it like we're right there. We want you to feel like you're, you're there, you're on the shores of the Galilee. It's, uh, it's one of the um, lowest lakes. It's not a sea. It's fresh water. They call it a sea. Um, sea of Galilee, Lake of G Gennesaret, same, same thing. They had a couple different names. Um, the only wa um, body of water lower, it would be the Dead Sea. So it's really, really low. It's, it's, it's a hot, arid place down there. It's very beautiful. And so what they would do is when they would go fishing, it wasn't like we think of like, you know, catch fresh. This was a major operation. This is commercial, this is commercial yeah, fishing. Exactly. It's what these guys did for a living. They yeah. had enormous boats. And then their, their nets were huge. They could be up to a half mile. They were amazing. In width. So you yeah. have to think, corks on the top to keep it up, weights on the bottom. They would put them between two boats. They would stretch it out. There we are. Stretch it <laughs> out. And then they I'll would be just, the second boat, okay? Yeah. And then they would just kind of dredge. And, and they would do this at nighttime because yeah. it was very hot and bright during the day. And fish, if you know anything about fish, they don't like hot and bright. So they don't come up to the surface when it's hot and bright. They go down, but at the nighttime it would cool off, and they would come 
up higher. So they were able to get their nets low enough and the fish were high enough and then they would just kind of go along and they would scoop out fish. So they would get a lot of fish you know, on a regular basis. Like I said, it was what they did for a living. What's really interesting about this little passage that's coming up is that they won't have gotten any fish. That is not normal. So no. just kind of bear that in mind. No, those of you who are fishermen, I mean, if you think for, you know, like what you're doing, if you were to replace that now and go out with a half mile long net to virtually any lake that's well stocked, you're going to get something, right? Something. Just statistically yeah. speaking. Plus, I mean, they were good at this. They kind of knew where the fish were. I'm sure that they had yeah. done this for a long time. Absolutely. So I think it's familiar. important to note that this is a commercial fishing operation. I mean, there were people who owned the boats, there were people who owned the lakes, and they were, these guys had a career. They were doing, I mean, this was not, I think oftentimes we see this period as sort of being like the dark ages. And yeah, no, they were pretty this sophisticated. Was, this is very similar to how we would have they a have fishing. They had taxes exactly, on it. I mean, yeah. you know, kind of like what we do they've today. Got, they've got all sorts of people. This is a big operation. They know what they're doing. They're professionals. Yeah. And notice, too, that, that Jesus gets into the boat, not just any old boat, gets into Simon's boat. Are you familiar with Peter, one of the disciples? This is him. Jesus, Before he's Peter. Well, actually, Jesus has already told them in another passage that his name yeah, is Yeah, so talk Peter. us through. This isn't like Jesus' first time chatting with Peter. No, it's not. It's, it's actually the third time that Jesus calls him to follow him. So the first time is in John chapter 1. I'm, I'm not seeing where I wrote. Oh, yeah. John chapter 1, 35 through 42, he calls Peter to follow him. Then in Matthew 4, 18 to 22, he tells him again to follow him. So Peter's kind of like a part-time follower of Jesus yeah. at this moment. He's still fishing, and um, you saw Jesus was at the house of him and he's his like a friend, wife, and, you know. And so he's he's chummy with them. He he obviously respects him, but he's, he's still a fisherman, you know. He's a he's a Jesus keeps saying, "Follow me," and Peter's like, "I'll catch you later." I sure will. I'll follow you Come a over bit to later. my house and heal sure. my mother-in-law real quick. Yeah, that's right. Come on over after synagogue and we'll chat. Yeah. You know. So he's he's not there yet. Uh, also, quick note, Jesus. So they've got this huge crowd on the shore. Mm -hmm. You'll see Jesus do this a couple of times. Is that he'll get into a boat and he'll cast off a little bit away from the shore. And this does two things. One, everybody can see him much better now, and he can't be trampled. <laughs> he can't be. He can't be crushed, right? Mm -hmm. And the water amplifies his voice, right? right. So you can hear better across water. It's, it's the perfect situation. Great. And they always sat down to teach. So it says he gets in the boat and he, he sits down and he starts doing what? Teaching. Like we keep saying, he came to teach and yep. preach and to share with people how they can be forgiven for their sins. Yeah. And Our, in verse 4 it says, when he had finished speaking, when he had finished his teaching, he said to Simon, put into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. <laughs> okay, so you have to understand, as they're cleaning and repairing their nets, and this is a huge job. I mean, you can imagine if it's a half mile long net, we have the largest ships here, we know based on the word that's used to describe these ships. These are huge and nets. And the nets too. The net is the bigger of the two that they would have used, so it's the really big one. Um, this is labor intensive. It's expensive as they're they've got the labor costs they've got the repair costs you know for whatever the material is and they they've just kind of been doing this and and they hadn't made any money last night so this is an expensive repair job yeah this is pricey and now yeah. jesus is asking um so take the nets that you just repaired um it's the middle of the day now i don't know if it's, but it's daytime it's hot yeah uh the fish are, are never at the top um what i want you to do is i want you to take those nets i want you to put them back into the water give it another go. And these guys are like, we're professional fishermen. We know this lake and we know how fish work. And you're a carpenter and a fisher. <laughs> there are no fish in this lake right now that we can catch with our nets. Yeah. And if we put them back in, we then have to pull them back out and wash them again and repair them again. And get it ready for tonight. <sighs> yeah, they it's had to be, be expensive. Like, oh. but, but look at, um, at Peter's response. And when it says in verse 5, he, he says, Master. That word master is just kind of like... I. I, I pictured him being like, all right, chief. <laughs> I mean, really, because it's not going to be a good idea. But you know what? You know what? I owe you one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you my, know mother, my, life, my wife is so happy right now. So because it's for you, chief, I'll do it. Okay. 
But it looks like he, he had minimal success getting other people out there. Because in a minute we're going to read, he had to call for backups. Like, everybody, all hands on deck. They all didn't go. So I imagine they were like, Peter, no, I'm not going out. I'm just going to take a nap, you know, and they didn't want to do it. So yeah. he probably goes out by himself. So this is great. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full, the boats begin to sink. That's a lot of fish. All right. What? So here we have the situation. These guys are 100% convinced there's not going to be any fish. And not only did they get fish, they got a miraculous number of fish. And, like an more unreasonable fish number of fish. Than probably they thought existed in the entire lake. Where did the fish come from? I don't know. Um, did Jesus just summon them from the entire lake and they were all there? Probably not because then they would have all been gone. <laughs> My guess <laughs> is that, that yeah, is that the creator of the universe probably just on the spot created fish. Mm -hmm. Here we go. He's done it before. He is the one that the Bible attributes the whole creation to. So yep. he generated fish out of nothing, and there they all were. Now look at Peter's response to this miracle. Can you go ahead and all read right. it? This is so beautiful. Verse 8, or in Luke 5, 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. No more, hey, chief, no more that. Go away from anymore. me, Lord, the name for God. I am a sinful man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So get the moment here. Peter, for the first time, and he's seen a lot. I mean, Jesus healed his mother-in-law, and he didn't have this reaction. But all of a sudden, he realizes, I am standing face to face with God. And his response is beautiful because all of a sudden he recognizes how unworthy he is. And 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 I, I love what Jesus does not say. Jesus does not say, no, 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 Simon, you're good. You're a good guy. Don't feel bad about yourself. You're a, you're a very nice person. That's why I like <laughs> you so much. He does no. not say that. Peter recognizes he is a destitute sinner. Remember that word poor that we talked about when, was that in um, Luke chapter 1, I think. Maybe it was even our first time where Jesus says, I came to preach the good news to the poor. And that, that word poor is covering your face with one hand and putting your other hand out. You can't even look up. That's the spiritual nature of how you come to Jesus. You go, I am a destitute sinner. I am unworthy. How could you even want me? And as Peter pulls away from him and says, go away from me. I, I can't do it. I'm not worthy. I am a sinful man. He pulls away. Look what Jesus says back to him. This is so beautiful. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So as Peter backs away, cowers away on his knees and says, I'm not worthy. Go away. Jesus says, come here. I want you. I chose you. That, my friends, is a picture of what moves the heart of God. And I say this because I know that in this general society that we live in, where we are told, you know, think the best about yourself. Follow your heart. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're great. You can be even greater. This is, this is not biblical stuff. And so when we stop, and maybe right now God has put us all in a place where we have more time to think than we've ever had before, mm -hmm. and you start to see the reality of who we are, and, and I'm just going to talk in first person because I can speak best about me. When I look inside my heart, it is, it is a dark, evil, scary place down there, and I fight my sinful nature all day every day. If I did everything I just felt like, I would be impossible to live with. My whole family would just want to absolutely kill me. You know, is there a, a desire in me to be good? Yes, because I'm made in the image of God and, and also because I have the Holy Spirit living right. in me, so he helps me do that. But even people who don't have that, yeah, they have a desire to be good because they are made in God's image. But I want us to recognize that when you come face to face with a holy God, it, it shows up 
who we are. And that is the moment that if we'll be honest, if we'll just be honest before God, God goes, thank you, thank you. That's where I want you to be. Mm -hmm. Come here. Come here. You're who I came to say. I want you. Yeah. You know, I we had we didn't discuss this in our prep, but I was just thinking this through is that Simon has had multiple encounters with Jesus prior to this. Mm -hmm. And you make a great point. He's seen incredible things be and, and in, in my mind in some ways I'm like, you know, <laughs> watching my mother in law brought back from the brink of death is almost a more amazing act than lots of fish showing up. And yet it's at this moment that his heart changes. And that he and that he recognizes his, not the at least three times before that we know of, not those this is the moment. And I'm curious to hear from you guys. I'm curious to hear from you what you think. Why is it that at this moment, this is the moment that changes things for Simon Peter? Why is it this? We want to hear from him. you. What do you think? Why now? Jesus has already called him twice to follow him. Yeah. We know he saw his mother-in-law be healed. And we expect he was in the synagogue when this demon possessed God yeah. because it, he was so close to the synagogue that they had no problem going back and forth. At the very least, together. he would have heard about it. Oh, yeah. I, no, but I think he was probably there. I really Yeah. I, because it, they all like went then to Peter's yeah. house. So. so he's seen things. He's watched Jesus and this, do some supernatural stuff and he this wasn't the moment. there. But boy, all of a sudden, he gets it. It's almost like this, this, uh, light switch flips on for him like light bulb moment mm -hmm. and and that's what liz says she says it's like an aha moment mm -hmm. like yeah. all of a sudden simon peter's there he gets it in a way he hasn't before i'm curious why it was this moment yeah. that did that for him jesus met peter at his level where he was at in a place he could understand from lorraine oh. this was that's in peter's really peter's Comfort this place. Wheelhouse, yeah, this is where yeah. he's no at. other explanation. Yeah, Ali says, I feel like we can compare this to telling people about the gospel. Some people need to hear it multiple times for it to really mm -hmm. kick in. Kathy says, personal experience. Mm -hmm. And Lauren says, I think this was the most personal to him. Jeanette says the same. This was directed at him. And this is, I mean, he's a fisherman. This is a huge part of his identity, right? Absolutely. He spends this is it. This is his life. most of his life on these shores with these fish, with these men, in these boats. Yeah. Deb says because the fish were something he could relate to. Yeah. Absolutely. This I is the way this. God wanted it. How many times does he call to us and we turn away? Mm -hmm. And yet this time, this time. <laughs> Billy makes an interesting point. She says, if Simon Peter does not know how to care for the sick, but he does know all about fishing, and he sees yep. now the magnitude of Jesus' miracles. I love that. Mm -hmm. Peter was in his happy place where he felt relaxed, able to process it. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. And I, I agree with all of that. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of that. In some ways, when Jesus comes, when Jesus shows up in the place that he has spent his whole life where he is the expert, Simon Peter knows about more about fish than some carpenter from Nazareth. It's not even like a body of water near Jesus in Nazareth. Like, he's the expert here. He should be able to go out here and be like, I've got this covered. Yeah. And then Jesus comes and says, I'm going to completely turn on its head everything you know about your whole life. Yeah. I'm going, I'm going to show you I know more. And I think you guys are spot on when you say this is meeting Peter at the place he was most comfortable, he felt most confident, he was most he was an expert. secure. He was an expert. This was his thing. And Jesus comes in and goes, oh, no, no. I know better, though. And and I, I think that in some ways even makes it easier for Peter to leave at this moment. Because he goes, okay, uh, clearly the thing I yeah. thought I was best at in the entire universe, yeah. uh, Jesus has me beat on. Why would I bother with this anymore? This, I this need to learn from this guy. is God. And, and what do you that. think it means when it says, um, don't be afraid from now on? You will catch men. What does Jesus mean by that? Let's pose that to you guys again. That's your right. answers yeah. are so stellar tonight. Yeah, so really top notch. Very insightful. Don't I'm be afraid. From now on, you will dream. catch men. Creates a mental picture that's pretty fantastic. It really does. You know what? Jesus was truly, well, I mean, this goes without saying, but like the most incredible teacher ever to live. Because Brilliant. Because he would get people where they were and use pictures of things that were around them that they mm -hmm. understood to make a spiritual point. So right after this huge catch, 
he says to Peter, don't be afraid. Like, I know you're destitute spiritually, and that's where I needed you to be, so good. And secondly, I want you to come because we're going to fish now together, and you're going to catch men. Look, do you have any comments? Yeah. Liz says, disciple of Jesus brings men hearts to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Peter knows now it's time to follow Jesus. Yeah. She also says, it reminds me of the woman at the well. She was the expert. That's actually a great point. Yeah, the woman at the well also was like, you know, she knew how to draw water. Jesus is going to tell her how to do that. Aubrey says he's going to share the gospel with others, bring others to Jesus, lead men to Jesus, discipling, bring disciples to Jesus, absolutely. Yeah, clearly pointing to Peter's future ministry as the leader of the early church. Good. Catch men by their spirits and teach them of the good news. Now, my friend Kyle's commented. Kyle's got an interesting perspective because all Kyle wants to do in his whole life is fish. He says, I'm a fisherman myself. We know Kyle. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. And some of the best conversations I've had with God were when I went out fishing in my boat. This is an example of God meeting Peter in his element, showing him how much greater he is than what Peter had placed his identity in, i.e. fishing. Oh, that's so beautiful. Really, really insightful. That's so love, great. Love your comments, and, and I believe that you are right. And was Jesus ever prophetic and correct here? I mean, yeah. You, you go on, and we, of course, we know the rest of the story. Little spoiler if, alerts, okay? If, if you've studied the Bible at all, you know that, that Peter does go on to make a whole lot of gaps and mistakes. I mean, he was like... He's the most relatable disciple. He, you just have to love him. But he goes on to really be that leader of the yeah. early church and win so many thousands and thousands of people. So I think not only is Jesus just saying, this is great, I, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do here, but he, it's actually a prophecy over Peter. You are going to fish for men, Peter. Yeah. And when Jesus gives a prophecy like that, you know it's going to come true. Despite Peter, because man, he was not easy to work with. <laughs> well, I feel like, Noel, we need to stop there. We, we, about 9.50. And well, we haven't done verse 11 yet. Oh. Let's okay. just do that real quickly. Mm -hmm. awesome. So they pulled their boats up on the shore. They left everything. Ah, yeah. And they followed him. I don't want to talk about leaving everything. Yeah. You know, Peter had been a part-time follower. Jesus had called him once. Jesus had called him twice. Follow me. Follow me. And Peter was like, as soon as I get a day off, I will be there. And, oh, on the Sabbath? Totally yours. Because yeah. we don't work on the Sabbath anyhow. You've got me. So I guess the question is, are we part-time followers of Jesus? Or are we full-time followers? And are we willing to leave everything? I mean... This guy left a secure job, he left his home, he left his family. He really did. He walked away in a second, yeah. which I think tells you how powerful of an experience it is with Jesus Christ. That this professional, you know, somewhat successful, I mean, fisherman got the job done. Yeah. Family man is like, you know what, you're more important. And it's so appropriate at this time where I think for many of you, and even for some of us in our family, the things that you've placed your identity in, the things you've placed your hope in, the things that you've been, they're gone. That's a really, I mean, it's a it's really a scary moment. Yeah. yeah, moment. And listen, Jesus may not call on you to actually leave everything. I think the question is, if he does, will you? Yeah. He might say, I want you to. It's kind of like when Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac, right? And we know from that story, way back in Genesis that Abraham had every plan on doing exactly what God said and God actually had to stop him at the last second because he was going to kill his son for God and God said I just wanted to know if you were willing yeah. you don't have to do it I've got a pl I've got another plan a ram in the thicket I've got a ram for you instead of your son and I think there are times in my life that I've had to make some really hard decisions and then it was like God said okay you don't have to I just wanted to know if you would and there's been other times that I've made those hard decisions hoping it was one of those times, and no, it wasn't. God totally took me up on it, and he made yeah. me do it. But you know what? It's never it's never a mistake to give it all to God. It is never a mistake. Yeah. And and Peter's life was so much more extraordinary. Can you imagine? His different. life mattered. We don't know about any other fishermen <laughs> they stayed know. fishermen. Yeah, we don't know about these. Fi they they just fished their whole life, and you know that's fine. But Jesus is calling us to an extraordinary life, and and part of that is 
sacrifice and being willing to do hard things, but also part of that is the joy and the fulfillment. You you feel yeah. complete, you feel full, you know you have a purpose, and that's that's incredible. And, and that's nothing exciting. can touch that. Nothing. The stock Everything market has it. no effect on it. You know what I mean? Your job has no effect on that because God's giving you a purpose. Well, we want to wrap up every night by giving you an opportunity. If you're listening, whether live or later, and you're going, I, this, yeah. <laughs> okay, so All I get this it. Makes sense. Um, I, I get it, and I need it, and I want it. God has moved in my heart, and I just need to know how do I proceed from here. We want to pray with you and give you an opportunity to cry out to the Lord, to repent of your sins, to invite him and ask him to be your savior, and um, in return to give your life to him. Absolutely. Okay. I would love to. Yeah, Jesus Christ gave everything for you. He's so ready. He's just waiting for you. He's so ready to just accept you in his arms. So if that's something you want to do, if you're like Peter and you're saying, you know, Jesus, I'm broken and I'm sinful and I'm, I don't know what to do, Please, this is your moment. This is this is what God's calling you to right now. So the words we say aren't what's important. What's important is what's happening in your heart. That's right. But it's also so helpful to do a physical manifestation of what's happening in your heart. And that's why we say this prayer is to just, you know, because we're put humans, some words on it. Put some <laughs> words. Put into put into really explicit words what's going on in your heart. So if you're feeling that, you can just repeat after me. I'm going to pray a really simple prayer. We're just going to say, Jesus. I admit that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short, and that I cannot do this life by myself. And I want you to invade my heart and take over. Jesus, I believe that you went to the cross to pay the penalty for my sins, and that on the third day you rose and you conquered death and you conquered sin. And Jesus, I want to accept the free gift of salvation that you have given me. Lord, I commit my life to you. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I want to pray with you now. Those of you who say, yes, I've already done that. I am already a child of God. He has already forgiven my sins, but I am struggling with just taking that step of going, yeah. okay, Jesus, I've been holding back, and I am ready for whatever you have for me. No holds barred. Let's roll. And I want to make that commitment to you. So I'm going to pray another prayer if, you, if that's where you are. Yeah. And you want to pray this along too. Again, it's not the words, it's the heart. And I'm just going to put some words on it for you to kind of help you get started in that direction. So, Lord, there are those of us tonight who are watching right now or, or today or whenever this is being watched, Lord, that you have stirred in our hearts. And we realize that we've been dumping our time and our efforts into things that are so very temporary. Lord, we've been fishermen. But we haven't been fishing for men, and we we really believe that you have something bigger for us than this present temporal world, and we want that. We want to serve you. We want to follow you, not part time, but full time. And Jesus, we just we give you our open hands right now. We don't even know what to do. We don't even know what that looks like. It's a little scary, and yet we we trust you as our Lord and our Savior to know that you're not going to drop us. And so this is just a moment where we're saying, I'm in, Jesus, I'm in. Whatever you want to do with me, do it. Uh, I'm 100% yours. I'm a full-time follower now. I'll be watching. I'll be listening. I'll be ready. And I, I just beg you for your help. And mm -hmm. I know that you won't leave me on my own to do this because I can't. But, but with you, you can accomplish amazing things through a broken vessel like me. So... My life is in your hands. I commit it to you. Thank you, thank you for loving me. Thank you for using me. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're always so grateful to get to just do these nights with you. I, I was talking to a so dear grateful. friend today who said, you know, there's a lot changing in our lives right now. There's a lot going on in the world that's super weird. And this is just a really, this is like the only consistent, sure thing. And he called it an anchor. An anchor. And this, this anchors that. our day, too. I look forward to this totally. every day. This is what I live for right now because yeah. I've got nothing else going on in my life. <laughs> you actually have a few things. I, I'm working. I have nothing. <laughs> I, I am. I am being very productive. But it. we love we love being here with you. Please share this with your friends. Um, there is there's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of fear in the world right now. And you have a responsibility to the people that you love 
to share with them the things that are helping you get through this. And so if this is one of those things that is that is helping you get through this time, that's giving you peace and hope, um, please share this. We would love to have more people come join us on this. Absolutely. And thank you again as well, really quickly, and then we really will let you go. For those of you who have sent us messages or texts, and you've just given us, or you've written on the page itself, which I also love, just a little insight as to what God is doing in your heart and in your life right now. And uh, I think every single one makes me cry Yep, multiple times. We might cry right now. It. We don't know if we feel like it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's, uh, and, it, and it's because it's not us. It's, it's watching like a front row seat to the power of so Jesus cool. Christ in people's lives. There is nothing I would rather than do that. Nothing. So um, if you have something to share, we share with lots of spirit from you. All right. Thank you so much. We awesome. love you. And um, tomorrow night, maybe we'll actually get off to a better start. Because Wouldn't that be exciting? This is a rough one. <laughs> we love you guys. Have a great day. Make good decisions. <laughs>